Welcome to Los Angeles. It is a sunny 18 degrees outside, right on the coast. I'd like to thank the uh, Cool Institute for Advanced Study at the University of Alberta for allowing me to sit here in Southern California and be part of a global conference around the world. I'd also like to thank Patricia Demer and Kirsten Uscalo for organizing this and hosting this and making sure that everything, everything went, went well. My name is Nigel Rabb. I am professor for Russian history here at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. And I'm talking in part because I wrote a book called Who is the Historian, which is a lot of it has to do with how a historian works with an archive, how a historian works with a librarian, with a library. And so I'd just like to give some thoughts and musings on, on where the historian fits in in this, in this new digital age. So, I want to start with the thoughts of two librarians. The first, well known to all, is Jorge Luis Borges. The second is Rafael Ball, the head librarian at the ETH or Technological University in Zurich, Switzerland. Borges wrote the Library of Babel to explore ideas of infinity and our ability to capture all knowledge in the universe. Theoretically, his universal library has an infinite number of hexagonal galleries organized in the shape of a sphere. The hexagon, hexagonon, hex, hexagon, sorry, the sphere and the symmetry of its organization all give a mathematical feel to the library, but Borges' library also has a mysterious physicality to it. His story is as much about wandering through the hexagonal rooms as the content of any single volume on the shelves. The, in the inhabitant of the library can dream about inexhaustible stairways. This labyrinth, as it is often being called, is a site of adventure that extels, extends well beyond the often useless content of the books. A less exciting vision of the library comes from a more contemporary source. Raphael Ball, the head librarian at one of Europe's most important libraries, has played a similar game and come to a conclusion representative of the digital age. He reckoned that with 80% of the books in his library just gathering dust because, well, they were a little better than trash, and with any single library only holding an ever-shrinking portion of the world's literature, it would do no harm to, to eliminate books altogether. The digitization, digiti digitization of books is not a surprise, but a head librarian's outright disdain for books appears rather shocking. And yet we cannot deny that research technologies have changed so dramatically in the last decade, his words are not as surprising as they appear. No doubt, digitization and future technologies are upon us, but we should not rush forward without exploring serious issue. In this new world, it is critically important to consider how the historian will intersect with the new methods of librarians and archivists. The research of the historian will change as librarians and archivists rethink their own methodologies. In his comments, Ball treats the library as a depository of books rather than as a physical space in its own right, an idea tightly tied to Borges. The physicality of the library deserves attention if we are to consider the complete experience of reading. We also have to take into account the risks of computerization and digitization. Library users have to reconsider their search strategies and the role search engines play in steering research outcomes, both in finding books in libraries and documents online. In the 1970s, Carl Ginsburg urged his readers to look for traces. What traces will be lost if we only have digital copies? The very nature of digitization suggests an interaction with documents radically, radically different to that experienced by the inhabitants of Borges Library. With this in mind, I also want to think about archives and how digitization can impact historical research there. The answers, of course, will come from the perspective of a historian a user of library spaces and archives, rather than from a library scientist, an archivist, a computer program, or a website designer. Therefore, the answers might be a little rougher around the edges, but coming from a user, they intersect and overlap with the concerns of library and archivists as we collectively assess our relationship to the digital age. In the past, individuals of a postmodern persuasion linked library catalog cataloging systems with efforts at social control. The Library of Congress system has been criticized for steering knowledge by determining the precise location of each book. While the criticisms of cataloging systems belong to a postmodern age that is largely behind us, we can still be concerned about social control, even as social control is not tied to philosoph philosophical assumptions about language. In particular, 
We have to look uh, to think about the control of social spaces. And here I would argue that the library is a bastion of freedom. The word bastion may hearken us back to an ivory tower, but as we shall see, it is really an open and accessible bastion. Increasingly, we've become accustomed to very controlled environments. The experience of a shopping mall, attendance at a professional sporting event, or even walking down many of the streets of Santa Monica, nearby in Los Angeles here, where music entices shoppers, all involve very complex planning and investments in understanding human behavior. Malls are notorious for controlling every single step of the consumer. In these circumstances, libraries can be seen as an oasis for everyone. Many, if not all, libraries have discarded admission requirements, so they are spaces open to all and everyone. Since they don't have so many visual and oral stimulants, individuals can craft their own time and space within these walls. There are so many opportunities for exploration, whether within the pages of a book or by simply walking around. Of course, even libraries feel the creeping impulse of social control. Starbucks has just kicked out the generic coffee shop and opened a branch in our own university library. It now serves as the welcome space for the library and has the exact same colors, contours, and flavors you see on every street corner in America. It standardizes the creative space of the library. Imagine if all libraries followed the exact same design pattern just as Starbucks has for all its interiors. Noise patterns in libraries also fit with the theme of social control. Over the last generation, an assault on quiet has emerged as quiet has somehow been associated with elitism, such as whispering in a museum or listening softly to a Spanish guitar. Armory Schaefer, the renowned Canadian sound researcher, long ago told the story of a library in Sacramento, California, which was wired for rock music in which patrons are encouraged to talk. On the walls are signs stating, no silence. The result, circulation, especially among, among the young, is up. The equivalent in our university library is the widescreen TVs that play sports for 24 hours a day in the coffee shop. Schaefer was writing at a turning point when pipe music wasn't everywhere. But today, libraries are one of the few places without aggressively manufactured oral environments. The idea of, a quiet, of quiet in a library is substantially different from the same idea 20 years ago. I wanted to talk about the library from the perspective of a user and not, a, and not provide a sociolo sociological analysis, but here an excerpt from a sociological study can broaden the sample. In a survey of researchers, a scholar remarked that I like the solitude and quiet of the library, one of the few places in this busy, fast-paced world where such a place can be found. Interestingly, the same survey found that younger scholars were just as likely to visit physical libraries even if the need to go to a library had changed over the years. These sociological findings indicate that visiting the library is not just about pulling a book off the shelf, but of integrating oneself into a physical environment in which books lie somewhere on the shelf. In Beijing, the National Library of China, North, is designed to feature the readers and not the books which surround the reading room. A visitor is more likely to share the quiet and solitude with another reader than to smell musty books on shelves. Another way to think of a library, in spatial terms, is to think of the origins of the words used to describe its traditional content and activity. Words such, in, such as book and reading do not have their origins in abstract and isolated thinking. In English and German, book and buch comes from the, come from the bark of the tree used to make that book. It is related to the Germanic box, which is linked with beach. Even the Latin Liber, as so many early origins in the Latin language relates to the fiber of trees from which material was made. The image of a solitary individual reading a book leaned, leaned, up, leaned back up against a tree has great symbolic meaning. In English, read has roots in the old high German, ratan, I'm sure my pronunciation is off there, and suggests counseling. In other words, reading does not necessarily have to be a solitary activity. It can certainly remain so, but it can be conducted in groups. This thought harkens back to the days when the literate members of society read aloud to those who could not decipher the text. Now that most everyone is literate, the reading groups, reading groups can be shared. One does not have to read loudly, but the oral dimension can give the text added tonality and rhythm. Art Marie Schaefer commented on the struggle to make the library an accessible place, an ongoing struggle, yet surely, 
there are more sophisticated solutions than just turning up the volume. Fortunately, Improbable Libraries by Alex Johnson has demonstrated just that. With architectural gems from around the world, examples of creative libraries abound. The Biblio Metro Madrid gives commu commuters a mobile selection of reading, and the University of Aberdeen Library in Scotland was designed to minimize energy costs and give visitors dizzying views of outside light shining in. But as his book demonstrates, not all libraries are for everyone. A street library has its function, and so does an academic library. Does an academic library have to be fun? Or how serious is an academic library allowed to be? That I want to leave as an open question, because it will find an indirect echo if we look at how the historian works together with the librarian, since cooperation amongst professionals is serious business indeed. So much attention has been given to the word interdisciplinary that it gives the appearance as if the entire planet can be neatly divided into academic disciplines. Interdisciplinary, if better than erecting strict disciplinary walls, still only tells part of the story because it has no way to include librarians whose expertise is essential to the work of the historian. I have yet to study or work at a university where librarians have been considered part of an academic department. Instead, they have been looked upon as handmaidens to the work of those officially aligned within departments. A very good example here stems from the fact that many historians pay scant amount of, of attention, pay scant attention to the amount of research invested in the library sciences and the infinite strategies developed to adapt libraries to shifting circumstances. The cooperation between a librarian and the historian has been exceptionally important before and after the digital age. Here the word reading, as in counseling, discussed above comes into play. The historian and the librarian seek counsel from each other and discuss ideas together. The collection strategies of libraries are directly related to focus areas of research. If a library has decided to focus on a certain area, researchers will be drawn to that area. Baylor University in Texas is home to the Armstrong Browning Collection, committed to the poets Robert and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. This library, collect collection run, this library collected runs of French and Italian newspapers from the 1850s onwards, newspapers which otherwise were destined for the dustbin. The library wanted these newspapers because they could shed light on what the two poets were experiencing when abroad. The newspapers do not have to be read in this spirit, however. Any researchers interested in Italian or French print culture in the second half of the 19th century will be drawn to this collection. The newspapers can answer questions about Italian nationalism or French anti-Semitism. Anti the decisions of the librarians to preserve these newspapers shape the way historians approach their topics. Li librarians are knowledgeable about their collections and can guide historians to works they might not even know exist. From a reverse perspective, historians can suggest purchases and help librarians build what effectively becomes a meeting place for a global network of scholars. Newspapers are physical entities. But the digital age will not eliminate this process. There will always be extensive cooperation between the librarian, who is often a trained historian, and the historian. Digital access to materials has made numerous aspects of research much easier. The destruction of card catalogs as artifacts is certainly disappointing, but digital searches give a very quick overview of materials, even if the content of those materials has still not been digitized. For example, when I started my own career, the Russian National Library did not have an online presence, so one had to wait until one's arrival in St. Petersburg to get a complete overview of the collection. Nowadays, one can search the digital catalog and develop an understanding for books that have been written on a specific topic. Of course, one should never rely on digital searches alone because each individual library has its own digitization policy and willy-nilly leaves time periods or themes out of the digital catalog. Moreover, these gap, gaps tend to change over time. One has a great advantage, but one has to be very careful to understand digitization as an important component in research rather than an omniscient force. Thus, digitization brings new issues to the fore, and librarians and historians have to work together to ensure the healthy collections of books, periodicals, journals, and many unexpected items. A very basic issue concerns digital acquisitions. Should the library buy digital copies or just subscribe to servers and lose access to archival copies once the digital subscription ends? For mainstream journals, 
the issue is solved rather easily. But tricky cases do emerge since access to documentation can change when new owners take control of a subscription service. Another important aspect of digitization concerns the original. Walter Benjamin is well known for having commented on the relationship between methods of technical reproduction and the reduced value of the aura that surrounds the original. He surmised that the technological reproduction of photographs would reduce the appeal of authenticity relative to the original act of creation that made painting such an attractive medium. In this worldview, the future belonged to mass reproduction. What does one lose and what does one gain by digitizing materials but that, by, that began their life in another format? Books offer an interesting case study in thinking about this question and did so by their very nature well before Benjamin wrote. We take it for granted that books will re be reproduced in high quantities. Most books published at the end of the 19th century can be purchased inexpensively today because the print runs with industrial methods were so high. You can buy any book and they're almost all alike. This attitude guides Google and its digitization project. Thousands of books are easily available digitally to readers around the world. The project has greatly facilitated access to books, but it has not eliminated problems associated with origins. Of course, with books, we are not looking to identify the very first copy of a print run. Rather, we want to know if all books are truly alike. Currently, our university library is scanning rare books from its collection many of which already exist on Google, to preserve aspects unique to each book. Fingerprints from past eras don't show up on the scan, but handwritten marginalia, former collector's book plates, new bindings and covers, prices, irregularities, overleafs obscured on Google, and other traces of the past are digitized, and thus each copy of a book becomes a unique item, and not just a generic Google copy. Not all books must undergo such extensive treatment, but we cannot empty library shelves and turn this extra space into a computer lounge simply because the texts are available on Google. Even with this sensitive project, digitization sanitizes the reading experience and eliminates critical aspects of material culture. For example, you can do extensive research with digital sources to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the Tsarist system vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union, but a more simple litmus test is to examine the paper upon which Tsarist and Soviet books were published. The deteriorating quality of Soviet paper says a lot about the economic situation in the Soviet Union, even if it doesn't answer questions about gender roles. Touching the paper actually affects the way one thinks about the different time periods, just as a Magna Carta written on vellum tells a different story than a reprint on contemporary paper. Currently, the overwhelming majority of historians work with materials that were born before the digital age, and have since been digitized. A new generation of historians will increasingly be working with materials that were born digitally. In light of projects such as Henri Rousseau's contemporary history, in which the boundary between past and present is blurred for analytic purposes, historical research is becoming more familiar with digitally produced sources. No one is yet quite sure which sources will remain for analysis, who will control those sources, and how we will search those sources with ever-changing technologies. These issues, unfamiliar to most researchers, are far from settled, though they are relative, relevant to large and small institutions alike. The Internet Archive in San Francisco, a self-described hybrid library archive, represents an interesting starting point for thinking about archiving digitally born documents. Although the Internet Archive digitis, digitizes physical materials as well, the most innovative aspect of the undertaking is the desire to archive the World Wide Web. The project is especially intriguing because it began already in the 1990s. The Wayback Machine, one of its most popular devices, takes snapshots of websites at apparently random intervals so you can type in a web address and see what the website looked like at, a certain moment in the, at certain moments in the past. It is useful, for example, if you want to see how website design has changed. Since it is so easy to use, it has been searched millions of times. You can look at the CBC site from the late 1990s and to get a sense for the CBC web presence in its earliest days. You also have the ability to click on links and navigate a page, much like you would expect from a current website. The Internet Archive requires massive servers to store all this information and amazingly has stored 25 petabytes worth of information. I personally don't know what a petabyte looks like, but that's a very big number. The Internet Archive is a fascinating project with incredibly dedicated archivists but perhaps it is most important for the provocative questions it brings forth. 
What does it really mean to archive the internet, the source of much knowledge today? The answers are multifold, and all the answers do is open up a road for further investigation. The Internet Archive trolls the web and its computer programs capture and save information from these searches. Despite its claims to capture all knowledge, most information on the web is inaccessible to its searches. We have this idea that the web has made all information accessible, yet really only a fraction of the information searches, searches on, uh, surfaces on web searches. It is incredibly easy to route a trip from Banff to Calgary, but is much more difficult to access internal systems of companies, the darker corners of the web, and military networks to name but a few. I've heard that Google only searches 5% of the web, and the computation of this number 5% is incredibly complex. If Facebook should ever go bankrupt, it will remain open as to who actually gains possession of their servers and the information on them. Similarly, historians in a later century will reinterpret the economic crisis of the last decade once they have complete access to the emails of leading Manhattan bankers. They might have developed different search engines that reveal a world unfamiliar to a generation of Googlers. It is even difficult to fathom what information still remains hidden from us. In another version of this, under new management signifies a reduced or altered access to knowledge. Corvus, a photography archive, recently sold a division to a Chinese company. According to the New York Times, the sale gives the new owner, Visual China Group, control over photographs of immense cultural and commercial value. Marilyn Monroe on a subway grade, Rosa Parks on a bus, Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. The Chinese company has digital control over the distribution of many of these images. Of course, many but not all of the images are readily available on the web. The important point here is that despite digitization and the free web, issues of ownership still persist and owners can still limit access to digital materials. Simply hoping that Google searches will solve our problems has its limits as well. In general, we should slowly become a little bit more suspicious of what Google has to offer the researcher. While the site has certainly revolutionized searching, its influence is worrisome. Even the general notion of searching with computer algorithms needs to be better understood by historians and libra librarians. One cannot escape the feeling that Google and its advertisers take you where they want to go and not where you want to go. As an example, it is only with great difficulty that one can avoid the anglicization of search results. In the case of Russian, my field, the only effective way to seek Russian websites and historical data is to use Yandex, the Russian search engine. Otherwise, Google almost inevitably returns what, in academic jargon, jargon might be considered Eurocentric results. In broader terms, the anglicization of the search process has ramifications for discourse theory and the remaining elements of the linguistic term. It may be a sensitive issue to suggest that Google is steering the historian, but we can make a parallel with the history of science. Years ago, before his, the publication of his famous monograph, Thomas Kuhn argued that textbooks steered the methods not just of students, but of well-established scientists who still held on to the methods they had learned from undergraduate textbooks. The dynamic quality of websites is also an issue for archivists. No two users experience the web in the same way. Pages are adjusted depending on what the web knows about you. As a, as a user of Yahoo Mail, I'm always fascinated to see that the women presented in the inevitable personal ads have been aging with me over the years. The system is obviously keeping track of my age. Beyond this comical observation, web ch pages change, mutate, adjust, and are never offering the same thing twice. Thus, with the Wayback Machine, you can many, navigate many parts of a web page, but numerous other elements are incomplete, and either the system has done a snapshot at one moment, not the next, or it has delved only so deeply into the layers of a web page. Of a web page. This apparent randomness has led to the indictment that the Wayback Machine achieves neither archival present, preservation nor access standards. Using a traditional means of, of explanation, one might say that the Wayback Machine gives a photograph of a 19th century street scene when the historian is really longing for a video. It is crucial to have a snapshot at the very minimum, but we are left wanting more. Already, the addition of web references into bibliographies and footnotes has required revision of books such as the Chicago Manual of Style. Digital archiving is no different and is spawning new methods each day. The technical questions and the abbreviations employed, mods, mets, Minerva, are baffling. 
Most of these methods will remain beyond the purview of the historian, but certain aspects of the process are worth mentioning. First, do archivists have a duty to store all available digital information? Is every scrap of digital existence worth preserving? Can we even afford to store and catalog this vast amount of information? Who will make sense of this unfathomably large collection of data? As with traditional archives, the process of archiving is not limited, limited to preventing the destruction of documents. This is not just a comment about the efforts of the Internet Archive, but also about all the information that is available digitally, whether it appears on the public web or not. The answers here are sensitive, especially when they come from the historian. Terry Cook, a Canadian archivist, has noted that historians have too often treated archivists as tour guides because visiting an archive is no different from visiting a foreign country. This has historical reasons because historians and archives have gone their separate ways, much like philosophers of history took their leave from the historical profession in the 1960s, archivists in English Canada took their leave from the Canadian Historical Association to form their own independent organization and publishing organ, Archivaria. In his work on Archives for the People, Max Evans never refers to historians as users and instead prefers the term consumers. No longer sharing a common cause with archivists, historians have let archives slip from their consciousness and pay scant attention to key archival practices such as appraisal and migration. In Cook's view, historians still expect to work in the virgin archives that Leopold von Ranke dreamed about in the 19th century. Even if Cook tends towards an overdrawn postmodern thesis and has omitted the fantastic archival practices of historian Patrick, Patricia Grimstead in Eastern Europe, his comments remind us how detached the historian has become from archival practice at precisely a time when archivists are determining and digitizing what the future will know about his past. Importantly, Cook mentions the increased professionalization of the field and their interdisciplinary partners that archivists find themselves working with. New alliances have been formed with records managers and information technology specialists. The science is creeping in. And these bonds have been cultivated with expanding graduate student opportunities for fledgling archivists. And here the risk is that the archivists become so involved with technological issues that they are distancing themselves from historians and other scholars. Historians need a minimal understanding of modern archival techniques and here the common denominator is information technology, a topic that surfaced when thinking about search engines. Historians as humanists may balk at learning quantitative methods, especially in the light of postmodernism, but there needs to be greater familiar, familiarity with archival processes in these uncertain digital times. Only then will historians be able to properly consider issues of preservation and appraisal, a process that stores 5% of materials in the absolute best cases. Archivists only have limited resources to appraise, preserve, and migrate physical and digitally born materials. Here the digital question has traditional undertones, and perhaps we should not exaggerate certain digital changes. In early March, an editorial in the New York Times worried that putting Lincoln online is no easy task. The ambitious Papers of Abraham Lincoln project, designed to publish everything Abraham Lincoln wrote, was being jeopardized by interagency feuding, party politics, and the withdrawal of public funding. These feuds, however, are not new, and the complete work syndrome has been politicized throughout the 20th century. Vladimir Lenin's complete works were never that complete because the Soviet authorities did not want them that way, and nor were Martin Heidegger's, where recent revelations have questioned previous attempts at a comprehensive publication. The New York Times editorial makes it clear that the Lincoln Project has been a cooperative project across the political spectrum for years, but we should not be surprised when funding and political issues do pop up. As Patricia Grimstead has shown, all these archival projects are deeply political and very closely tied to specific community needs. The historian can assist and cooperate with archivists to reestablish a lost bond and ensure that future generations of historians have access to digital sources that further historical research. If the historian does not make a greater commitment, the historian risks losing track of documents essential to the trade. We will trick ourselves into believing that the internet has provided fantastic access to documents, but we will have no idea where those documents came from. Over the last century or so, the, no, the urban dweller no longer knows how food reaches the table, and many individuals eat beef without understanding that it comes from a cow. Historians will no longer know where the digital depositories lie, or even the physical sources, 
and it will experience alienation from the context of documents. This is not just a point about the physicality of documents and the missing mustiness of an old folder, but of respecting a sense for the physical location of the archive. Since ultimately, as the servers at the Internet Archive prove, even digital bits exist in a fixed location. Historians cannot afford to base their research on digital documents without intersecting with the different intellectual, technological, and professional layers that make this style of archiving possible. As a recent exhibit at the LeBand Art Gallery here at Loyola Marymount University set out to demonstrate, the digital universe has not replaced the importance of the human dimension. This is a practical matter of physical and digital significance. An archivist once pointed out to me that digitally born materials have their own physical histories that are difficult to trace and organize. We are familiar with annotations on textual documents, and scholars have traced words that seem scratched out or subject to handwritten additions to drafts with scrutiny, or, or have subjected handwritten additions to drafts with scrutiny to gain further insights into an author's intentions. The digital age is no less drafty, but the property process is more difficult to access. Depending upon how authors save their text files, the documentary record will change. The word multi-layered has gained in popularity over the years, but here's a real case where it is not quite clear how we will pull apart these digital layers, these different draft files, if you will. It is critically important for the historian to have access to this redaction process to recognize deviations in what otherwise might appear as straightforward decisions. These thoughts seem to create more problems than the answer, but the historian is still working in a very uncertain digital world. Even if the internet came to life over two decades ago, digital methods and digital access are still in their infancy. The historian will have to adapt to electronic resources without forgetting about physical documents as well. It is not unimaginable that a digitally bred generation of historians will ignore physical documents only to have a lonely genius rediscover them and reinterpret that history. Just like shifting priorities and language skills at graduate programs change the subject matter historians write about, the ease of access to digital sources will cause trends of its own. In anticipation of future trends, the emphasis in the last 20 or so minutes has, has voiced concern and caution in three main directions. First, we cannot disembody research practice. Historians need interesting spaces that encourage creativity. If we have libraries that twist and turn and corners around which we might spot another visionary, we are in a better place. Second, the historian has to reconsider his or her relationship with partners in libraries and archives, for these are the fields that will determine the future of digital management. As the nature of storage changes, historians have to keep abreast of these developments, even if it might apply unpleasant forays into information technology. Finally, we must further probe the interaction between existing physical objects and documents and their digital presence. It is too risky to rely purely on the process of digitization for all the reasons lifted above, listed above. If interdisciplinarity has been all the rage for the last two decades, then maybe we need to speak of an interdocumental approach in which we embrace materials in both their digitized and pre-digitized form. We need both. Here in Ball, the head librarian at the ETH in Zurich might disagree, but we don't want research in the humanities to become that type of sanitized exercise we would expect in a chemical laboratory. Nietzsche, Heidecker, and others have used the force as a metaphor explore for exploration because it, because it has hidden paths, dark corners, and unpleasant surprises. This is precisely what makes research exciting and gives the thrill to reading Borges' tale of a labyrinthine library. We need both a physical and a digital labyrinth. Thank you very much for your time.